Business entrepreneur and executive film producer Steve Sarowitz was born and raised as a reformed Jew in the south side of Chicago, Illinois. He first encountered the Baha'i faith in his early 20s while attending the University of Illinois. Almost 30 years later, a philanthropic trip landed him in Haifa and Akka, Israel, the world center of the global Baha'i community, where he soon after declared his faith in Baha'u'llah. Today, Steve celebrates the release of a new documentary feature film he produced called The Gate, which tells the story of the life of the Bab, the forerunner of Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. In this interview, Steve talks about the release of this exciting new film, the first of its kind, as well as the amazing experts behind the project and the process and challenges of making a film about a faith he had only been a part of for just three days. Steve, thank you so much for joining us on Cloud9. It's my pleasure, Shadi. Now, you weren't raised in the Baha'i faith. You were raised as a Reformed Jew. Can you explain what that is and what what that looked like? Yes, both my parents are Jewish, and Reformed Judaism is the most liberal arm of Judaism. The Orthodox are very much into the rules and very strict in terms of adhering to the rules. The Reformed Jews are much more liberal about the rules, uh, very much uh, for equality for women. Uh, There's female rabbis, which you wouldn't see with the Orthodox. Also, women can sit next to men, which you wouldn't see with the Orthodox. Also, you won't see. uh, Most Reformed Jews are not kosher, which we were not. So I was raised um, very relaxed Jewish. We went to temple a few times a year, and that was it. I went to Sunday school. I went to Hebrew school. Um, But I didn't really learn a lot about theology. I learned the old Bible stories, at least from the Jewish part of the Christian Bible, what, what we would call the Torah as Jews and Christians would call the Old Testament. I wasn't passionate about religion. I always believed in God my whole life. Uh, One of the reasons I believed in God, actually the biggest reason, was my mother had a life after death experience when I was six months old. She almost died. And she um, actually had a bright white light that showed her images of her life and asked her if she wanted to go on to the next world or stay in this one. And she ended up staying. She's still here over 50 years later. Very thankfully for me and my siblings. And uh, so I figured if my mother talked to God, then I would believe in God. So when did you first hear about the Baha'i faith and what first when caught I your college, attention? When I college, I went to Hillel uh, for a presentation on the Baha'i faith. I was about 20 years old. Hillel is the Jewish Students Association. This gentleman there told me about this concept called progressive revelation. And again, a, a mind-blowing idea. Instead of me thinking that Jews are right and Christians were wrong, or maybe perhaps Christians were right and Jews were wrong, or maybe both Christians and Jews are wrong and Muslims are right, he explained that all religions could be right and that the essence of all religions is really one, that it was really a single eternal faith of God and rolled out over different ages through the different prophets, the different messengers, and that all the messengers really work together as as opposed to opposing each other. So Jesus did not have to oppose Moses, and Moses didn't have to oppose Muhammad, and their essential message was really one and the same. And the only difference was that there's, in different ages, humanity has different needs, and those different needs are then addressed specifically with different laws and social teachings by the prophets. And I thought that was a great concept right from the start. So when did you actually uh, declare your faith in, in Baha'u'llah and become Oh, well, I heard that when I was 20, and since I was so impressed and such a uh, fast learner, it took me only 29 years to become a Baha'i. <laughs> so um, about five years... Never too late. five years after that, my wife, uh, who was then my girlfriend, asked me, um, what religion do we want to raise our children if we were to someday get married and have children? She was Catholic. She is Catholic, actually. And, and uh, me being Jewish, she said... Judaism, would you like to raise our children Jewish or Catholic? And I said, uh, of course, Baha'i. And um, she said, no, a real religion. And I didn't know enough to defend the Baha'i faith at the time. So we ended up years later getting married. And years later after that, um, we had children. And it wasn't until the children were a few years old that I began studying the Baha'i faith. It must have been around seven or eight at the time. And it, 
it wasn't until a few years after that that I decided to become a Baha'i in 2013. And I went running home to my wife and said, I'm a Baha'i now. And she said, no, you're not. You have to wait for the kids' bar mitzvah in another two and a half years. They were almost 11 at that point. And uh, so I was sitting there patiently waiting for the children's bar mitzvah when God intervened. And six months later, my company that I started went public. And we'd already been wealthy. And we all of a sudden were very wealthy. And so I wanted to do philanthropy. I called up a gentleman by the name of Bill Strickland and said, I'd like to build a center on the west side of Chicago to help uh, mainly African-Americans because I think there's a lot of uh, injustice in our city. And I thought he could help me. He's built these centers all over the United States. And that went great. We had a great conversation. We agreed to do this. And then about five conversations in, he says, I'm talking to these Jewish philanthropists in Miami. And we're talking about a center in Akko, Israel, if you can believe that. And I was just shocked. I, I said, Bill, did you just say Akko? And no way. So that, that's such an amazing coincidence. So essentially, for those of you who are not aware, the Center for the International Baha'i Community is located in Akka, Israel. And it's essentially where Baha'is face and pray I, to. I, I jumped day. on the opportunity. I went to Akko. And while in Akko, I stepped into the garden. Uh, of at the shrine of Baha'u'llah and I started crying and had an incredibly emotional spiritual transformation that really has changed my life ever since um, I saw world peace in that garden I saw that Baha'u'llah had brought a new age for all of humanity and I saw that that garden that garden of Eden was sitting there miles away from a war zone and uh, within a few months, I was a Baha'i, even though I, I didn't wait for the bar mitzvah. <laughs> you couldn't wait any longer. I, I think uh, <laughs> Baha'u'llah had called me. Uh, what was your wife's reaction to that? Well, I went to my rabbi first, and I said, can I become a Baha'i? And he said, uh, uh, you're not a Baha'i already. And then my children, uh, they, were, they still were a little worried. I said, don't worry, I'll pay for the bar mitzvah, and I'll come, and we'll have a good time. And they were okay after that. And then my wife was a little bit upset with me because I'd made a commitment. And she said I was breaking my commitment. And, and I was. But I, I just told her, I'm really, really sorry, but I have to do this. And she finally agreed. How wonderful. It's lucky for you, I suppose. Could we talk a little bit about your career path? Because I know that you didn't start off in filmmaking. So how did you end up making a film about So uh, three days after. So on February 10th, um, 2015, I declared as a Baha'i. Three days later, I emailed a friend of mine who was also in the payroll industry, which is the industry where I made my money. And uh, he is a very friendly competitor, and he's been a Baha'i for his entire life. And I emailed Farseed, and I said, Farseed, I'm a Baha'i now. I said, I want to retire in a few years and just teach the Baha'i faith. And Farseed said to me, you could do that. You could reach hundreds of people. But if you made a movie, you could reach millions of people. And within an hour of my conversation with Farshid, I got an email from a gentleman by the name of Peter Samuelson. And it just so happened that Peter is also a movie producer. In fact, he produced a very famous movie called Revenge of the Nerds. So here I am talking to a, a famous, a relatively well-known Hollywood producer less than, a hour, less than an hour later after I had been told to make a movie. He said, fly out to L.A. I was flying out to L.A. anyway, and we ended up meeting, and in the course of our conversation, uh, we ended up running into another Hollywood producer who was sitting right next to us, uh, who had also been talked to about a Baha'i movie, and I thought, wow, these are too many signs. And I thought, well, I, I think I should maybe do this. And, and Peter thought it was a good idea and said to go do it. Um, two years later, almost to the day, um, we were in Peter's living room filming the first interview for the movie. So could you tell us a bit about your yes, new uh, film? Yes, first of all, I'm very happy to announce that as of a couple days ago, we have a Peabody Award winning director, Bob Hercules. The movie depicts the amazingly exciting story of the Bob. It starts out in the 1840s with great expectations among Jews, Christians, and Muslims that a promised one will come. The Jews expect the Messiah, the Christians expect Christ, and the Muslims expect the return of the 12th Imam. The Jewish expectations end in disappointment. The Christian 
expectations all over the world end in disappointment. Yet the Muslim expect expectations at the same exact time, which is ironic, the year 1844, in Persia do not end in disappointment. The Bab declares on May 23rd, 1844, as the promised one of Islam, the return of the 12th Imam. And our movie follows the, uh, his very brief but uh, amazing career in ministry um, and how he's really shows how he's changed the world even up to this very day and how he heralded Baha'u'llah, who then declared as the promised one of all faiths. So what inspired you to make a film about the Bob? I mean, not many people have really heard well, of him I before. I wanted to make a film to help spread the word that the Baha'i faith exists. We're not looking necessarily to convert people and make them Baha'is, but so many people have just never even heard of the Baha'i faith. And to me, it's amazing. You know, if you look at the world, there's only very few major religions. There's a lot of sects within those religions, a lot of divisions. So if you look at Christianity, there's, there's thousands of different types of Christianity um, and there's different types of Islam. But when you really look at the major religions, there's only a handful. There's Islam, there's Christianity, there's Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, and then there's really not too many others. There's divisions within those. And the, the only religion that's newer than 1400 years old in the entire world is the Baha'i faith. And so I think it's amazing that more people don't even know about the Baha'i faith. So I. So why, why the title? The Bob's the gate? name, actually, that's a direct translation of the Bob's name. Uh, the Bob means the gate. And if you go to Muslim cities throughout the Middle East, they have these beautiful Bob's there, gates. And they're not like a garden gate that you typically think of in the West, but they are beautiful, ornate gates leading into these cities. And uh, I think of the Bob as an incredibly beautiful gate leading all of humanity into the new age and into the Garden of Paola. That's a really beautiful analogy. Could you share a bit about the person of, of the Bob and how he paved the way for the coming the of Bob the Bob was really Bible. unusual um, in, you know, in many, many ways. Um, we as Baha'is believe he was a messenger of God. And every 500 to 1,000 years, God sends a messenger of God. So the previous one before him was Muhammad. Before that was Jesus. And so it's not every day you see a messenger of God. Um, he was known for his innate wisdom. In fact, when he was sent to school, they sent him home because they couldn't teach him anything. He was a merchant prior to declaring as a messenger of God, and he was known for his absolute honesty. Um, he was just um, impeccably honest. You could, he would never lie or cheat anyone, and he was ultimately fair down to the penny. He was known for tremendous virtues. He was tremendously pious, tremendously honest, kind, um, just uh, like every messenger of God, his person was the greatest proof of who he was. And then he was also a prolific writer. He wrote the equivalent of dozens of Christian Bibles in a six-year ministry. So he, um, he really, unfortunately, his life ended after only six years of ministry, but his contribution to um, the age is amazing. And he sacrificed his life for humanity, much like 2,000 years earlier Jesus Christ had done. So as you've mentioned, the Bob had a very difficult and, and tragic life. What aspects of his life and identity did you want to highlight through the I making think his, of well, the Well, throughout gate? the gate, uh, the, the story, his story is quite amazing. Uh, Shoghi Effendi, who was the guardian of the Baha'i faith, the great grandson of its founder, uh, compared the Bob's life to the story of Jesus Christ. And he said that there was no story um, even close when it came to comparisons and parallels to Jesus Christ, and I would agree. Uh, a young, uh, charismatic uh, prophet going against a very entrenched orthodoxy. Uh, the story of his martyrdom is, is quite amazing. Uh, he was shot at uh, 750 times, and when the smoke had cleared, he disappeared. They, they found him back in a cell, and uh, he had told them before they tied him up, uh, they suspended him against the wall, that, that he, no earthly force could take him until he was ready to go. And when they found him back in his cell, he said, okay, I finished my mission now, now you can kill me. And so they actually had to take him a second time and tie him up or suspend him from the wall. 
And uh, it was only after the second try with 750 guns that they were able to uh, kill the bomb. Uh, his incredible teachings, um, I, he had some wonderful teachings about the resurrection, about the oneness of all things, animals, plants, humans. His teachings really are the basis, uh, the underpinnings for the Baha'i teachings that Baha'u'llah brought. They kind of fit like hand in glove. So I find that the Baha'i teachings in general unspeakably beautiful and really applicable to, to the problems we have in today's world. So because this was the first time that you'd ever made a film at such a scale, could you share a little bit about what you learned and some of the tricks of the trade uh, that you gained throughout well, this experience? Well, I'd never made a film before. So uh, I like to say that, uh, you know, three days into it, I decided to, uh, three days into being a Baha'i, I decided to make this film. If, if God had waited four days to ask me to do this, I might not have done it. I might have been too smart. But uh, probably uh, foolhardy to do what I did, which is to start making a multi-million dollar film uh, with no filmmaking experience uh, and three days experience in the particular religion that you're, <laughs> that you're talking about. <laughs> but I have done things before. As I mentioned, I'm an entrepreneur. And uh, so first of all, in any business, you know, what I learned along the way is filmmaking is a business. And so we need to put people in, in the places where they're best. Yeah, totally. Uh, you have an amazing team. Could you share a little bit about who they are and their involvement in the I've been very fortunate to work with some amazing people. Um, Ed Price, um, who's been by my side throughout this venture, is an amazing Baha'i scholar, uh, really deep in Baha'i. He's taught me a lot about the faith, not just helping me with the movie. Bob Hercules is, is a consummate professional. I, uh, Adam Monshine, who's become our co-producer, was an actor. We originally hired him as an actor, uh, Mullah Hussein. And he ended up being our acting coach in Spain uh, and then eventually helped us really finish the movie. Uh, Jan, who's our editor, has done a, uh, an outstanding job. Um, just every step along the way, um, Trisha Ford, who is, a, she's only coming towards the end of the movie, but has done a great job in, in really organizing us, uh, kind of taking care of every administrative task and, and then quite more than that. I've, I've just been very fortunate to have good people around me. The experts that we interviewed, I'm in awe of, uh, particular Dr. Nader Saidi. Um, he's forgotten more in the last five minutes about the Baha'i faith than I'll ever learn. Uh, he's one of the greatest religious scholars in the world. And I've been, only thing I can say is I've been privileged to spend the afternoon, actually more than one afternoon, to, to spend several days listening to Nader and learning uh, as much as I can, like a sponge about the Baha'i faith and about the Bab and Baha'u'llah. Um, we were very fortunate to um, interview Farooz Kazemzadeh before he passed away. I, again, I've been, I, I guess I'm just grateful to the people I've met along the way. What was your intention behind interviewing and meeting with these well, experts? Um, most of the experts, especially initially, were academics, uh, like professors and people who were experts in the faith. So we're trying to get their expertise and really verify that we got the story 100% accurate, that you know, accuracy was really our intention. As we looked at the interviews, we realized we needed to maybe spice, uh, spice them up a little bit, get a little bit more energy. And so we got Laylee Miller, who's uh, really a superstar in the Baha'i world. She runs Tahereh Justice Center, and she's an amazing woman. We also um, got uh, Joy DeGruy. We were very fortunate to have Joy DeGruy in our film. And, she is also an amazing speaker and an amazing Baha'i who became on her own a Baha'i at 13 years old. She's, and we also have Rain Wilson in the film, who's well known uh, as an actor in the office. But I, uh, I've been very pleased to get to know Rain and realize what, again, I, I, I keep using the word amazing. I have to come up with a synonym. She's been nothing but kind and giving to me in the course of this project. And I really appreciate that as a new Baha'i who doesn't really know anything. Um, I, I know a little bit now, but he's been very very helpful to me. And you also worked with uh, Hooper Dunbar. Who's oh my God, I forgot Hooper well. Dunbar. Hooper Dunbar is an amazing artist and an amazing Baha'i. Uh, we had a lot of amazing people we interviewed. So if I forgot you, it wasn't on purpose. <laughs> That's okay. What kind of role did these experts play? Like, what is, how does the it film... It is entirely work? biographical. Is it... it is a documentary. It's not a docudrama. It's really um, just a, really the story of the Bob's life and his teachings. 
And so it's it's really a very straight documentary. It's not we're not trying to jazz it up. We're we're trying to be as accurate as possible and really tell the story of the Bob as an interesting story to even non Baha'is who have no interest in religion or the Baha'i faith. I think we think they'd be very interested in this extremely exciting story. What were some challenges that you encountered in making this film? Well, besides my own utter inexperience, uh, which is probably the biggest challenge, uh, we had to make a story about a manifestation of God, a messenger of God, who we could not show on the screen because the Baha'i faith does not allow us to show any of the messengers of God on the screen. Uh, we cannot depict them in anything, either pictures or plays or movies. So we're showing a film essentially with where we can't show the main character, which uh, presented, to say the least, a challenge. Did you know this coming into making a yes. film about the um, But we actually didn't know all the rules. And what was really interesting is the Universal House of Justice, which is the highest Baha'i administrative body, didn't know the rules either. I mean, they knew the rules, but they had never had someone really go and fully make a movie about the Bob. So we worked um, collaboratively with them to figure out what we could and couldn't do in terms of showing the Bob. We actually spent a day in Chicago filming uh, a lot of different options for not filming the Bob, such as showing his hands, his back, his shoulder, shadow. And we ended up uh, giving all those to the House of Justice. They considered it and told us we couldn't do any of them. So we ended up really having the Bob completely absent from the film to the point where we can't even show other people conversing with him. So it's very, very strict. And so we it sounds like very constraining parameters to work within, but... I suppose an amazing learning opportunity for yourself and the Baha'i community, also the directors, but most importantly, uh, the Baha'i institutions. And we, we were fine with that. It uh, was a little bit of a challenge for Bob Hercules, our director, and, and Keith Walker, our director of photography, but they are professionals and they really did an amazing job. Neither one of them are Baha'is and they both did an amazing job uh, along with Adam and Ed, who also came up with ideas and even a couple of ideas from me. Uh, on how to get around that problem. The other challenge, which is a, a kind of a, uh, a corollary to that, is that he's a messenger of God. So imagine you're the person who's doing the first movie about Jesus, and the whole world hasn't heard about Jesus. Basically, if you really look at it statistically, almost nobody has heard of the Bob. And yet, in my eyes, in the eyes of all Baha'is, the Bob is every bit equal to Jesus. And so we're trying to bring this incredibly transcendent figure to the world, and we have to do it in such a respectful uh, way and accurate. And so there's a big challenge there. And I know I didn't do it as well as I could have and should have, but I, I, I will, hopefully, God will be okay with me knowing I did the best I could and all of us did the best I could. And there's a lot of passion at Baha'is in this project. Um, another one I should mention who's been hugely helpful is Kathy Hoganson, who's a great Baha'i author and really a, uh, a phenomenal Baha'i who's been an advisor along with Ed Price and Nader Saidi, really helping me every step of the way. And uh, another person I should really thank um, is Ken Bowers, who's the secretary of the Baha'i National Spiritual Assembly. We work very closely with them, and Ken has been... Uh, I have to come up with another word, but he's been amazing. excellent to work with. <laughs> he's been amazing. I know. I'm, you're going to think I only know one word, but he really is. What were some tenets or teachings of the Baha'i faith that you were able to incorporate into your own practice of making the film? Like, I'd imagine reverence and, and respect is, is a big one when you're, you're making a film about a founder of, of a faith. But is there anything else? Absolutely. Um, I... We were very, very careful, um, and I'd say Ed Price was my biggest guide on this, to guide me onto making this film in a Baha'i fashion. And so one of the things he counseled me again and again is to try and maintain unity with our team. And uh, we have been very collaborative, and we've done something called Baha'i consultation over and over again, where we put our ideas out there. And even though I'm the executive producer, and I can pull rank anytime I want. I don't very often, almost never. I, I generally say this is my idea, and I, I've learned this as a Baha'i. I can tell you this has been something I've used in all my businesses, is that I am less 
dictatorial than I, I ever was in the past. I don't say this is my way or the highway, which I used to do quite a bit. Instead, all of us put our ideas out there and all of us have been, and including the non-Baha'is, including Bob and, and Jan, have worked, and I, I, I've been just thrilled with how collaborative the process has been. And we, we have consciously tried to do that as Baha'is. Um, the other thing is truthfulness is the, is the foundation of all virtues. So definitely being honest to a, a fault is something we've done. Uh, kind, uh, Abdul Baha, who is the exemplar for Baha'is, the son of Baha'u'llah, he said to be kind to everybody. Uh, so where can people learn more about the life of the Bab? In your research, I'm sure you've come across amazing resources. Well, uh, William Sears, one of my favorite all-time Baha'is, he's a wonderful author. He wrote a, uh, an incredible book called Thief in the Night, and he wrote another book called Release the Sun, which is a story of the Bob. Ed Price doesn't have his book out yet, but he will, and it's going to be part of a series called The Divine Curriculum, and that should be coming out. Hopefully, in the next few months, he'll have a book on the Bob. This is not for the faint of heart. You could read The Dawnbreakers. The Dawnbreakers um, is the longer version of Release the Sun. Um, and it's uh, the amazing story of the Bob and his, uh, his mission. Uh, there are, um, if you are in Chicago, you can come to the Baha'i Temple and there's a wonderful bookstore and there's bookstores in all the Baha'i temples. There's nine in the world. Um, and there's also Baha'i centers. So if you have a Baha'i center near you, you can go to your Baha'i center and look for books on the Bob. And of course, online, there's a tremendous amount of information at Baha'i.org on the Bab, Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, and all the key figures in the Baha'i faith. I haven't mentioned one of the key figures I have to mention, or especially to you, Shai. The most popular, who do you think the most popular character in our movie is, by far? I want to say Tahereh. You better say Tahereh. <laughs> Tahereh um, is amazing. Uh, Tala Delvarani, who portrayed her, is Persian. She's not a Baha'i, but she's Persian. Wonderful. Um, Ta Tala was a delight to, to work with on the set. Um, really beautiful inside and out. And um, Tahereh, the character, is amazing. Oh, I use that word too often. Wonderful. It's, it's perfect, spectacular. Uh, the ideal woman. Um, she was beautiful. She was brilliant. She was brave. She was so beautiful that the king of Persia asked her to marry him, but she turned down the king of Persia and said, no, you keep your religion, I'll keep mine. She was so brilliant, she was a religious scholar, which was so unusual for a woman in that day. And she was not only just a religious scholar, but when the Muslim scholars tried to debate her, they had no chance against her. She was just one of the greatest theologians of her time. And she was a brilliant poet as well. And to this day in Iran, her poems are very popular. What they don't tell you in Iran, because they uh, persecute the Baha'is there, is that she was a Babi, that she was a follower of the Bab. She, her, her poetry, her, the, the, her acumen as a theologian were really unparalleled. And on top of that, she was an amazingly, from what I've heard, and, uh, he, she was a very pure person, very spiritual, kind, uh, charismatic. Uh, what I wouldn't give to meet Tahereh. Uh, she was the greatest woman of her dispensation. She was quite the, quite the feminist as well for her time. Yes. Um, she actually, um, in 1848, she was the one to publicly announce that the Babi dispensation was a new religion. So the Bab actually created a new faith called Babiism, which was then uh, replaced by Baha'i 19 years later when Baha'u'llah declared it by design. The Bab said his faith would only last for, a few, for several years. And then he, he said, the one who shall be, who, the one whom God shall make manifest will appear. And that, of course, ended up being Baha'u'llah. But uh, Tare took off her veil in public in 1848 at the very first conference for the Babi faith and announced that this was a new faith and announced that there were new laws. One of the new laws was equality of women, uh, equality between women and men. And, and uh, the, within a couple of weeks of that, the first women's rights convention happened in Seneca Falls, New York. So she was really um, 
as far as I can tell, the first women's rights act activist in the world and one of the greatest ones ever that everyone should hear her name. Uh, and of course, I have considered in the future making a movie about Tahereh since just about everyone has told me, you need to make a movie about Tahereh too. And uh, I would love to make a full length uh, drama, a full length picture, not a documentary uh, about Tahereh. So until that time comes, where can people learn more about the film that you'll be releasing in the next few weeks, The Gate? So they can go to our website. Uh, they can find us on Facebook at The Gate Film. You can also um, find us uh, at our website, which is www.thegatefilm.com. And they can find us on Twitter as well. And when will the film be released? The film will be released in May. Um, it will be released nationwide on ABC. And there will also be uh, grand opening premieres in Chicago and Los Angeles. The Los Angeles premiere will be on May 9th, and the Chicago premiere will be on May 12th. And for those of us who don't live in the United States, is there a way to watch the film online or access it? Through we are going to be requesting permission to show it internationally. We certainly hope that we get that permission. And if we do, we will be able to have showings all over the world. Um, we will also be... Uh, putting it out there within the next few months to places like Amazon Prime and or Netflix, wherever we can put it up on uh, for, for streaming. So internationally, it will be available for streaming. And we hope to get permission to stream it uh, with subtitles in many different languages. Wonderful. Even in Canadian, whatever Canadians speak. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know. <laughs> it's a bit of everything, I suppose. Thank you so much, Steve, for joining us on Cloud9. Really appreciate your time and uh, your initiative in creating this, I'm sh what I'm sure will be a beautiful film and learning experience for many of us. That means a lot coming from you, Shadi. Uh, as you know, I'm a huge fan of yours. And for anyone who doesn't know Shadi and how beautiful her music <laughs> is, I need to put a shout out for Shadi. Um, <laughs> several... It's about you. This podcast is about you, Steve. <laughs> I'm still going to talk about you, Shadi. And, uh, and that you're a wonderful singer and, and one of, uh, we've been very fortunate to be blessed with several young Baha'i singers that are doing a great work for us. And so anyway, uh, for those of you who haven't heard her music, please listen to Shadi's music. Too. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, take care and we hope to catch up soon and, and learn more about your journey.